Hello, good afternoon from Northeastern Virginia. This is Brian. I've just gotten back from seeing Alien Romulus. Short review is, it's a nice enough movie, a kind of greatest hits, uh, nostalgia trip, very effectively done. But what I wanted to talk about today, really quickly, was to continue my previous theme about the existential threats facing generative AI. Now, last week I gave a, a quick video about that. I mentioned a few different threats that I think everybody involved in thinking about technology should bear in mind. Uh, one was the threat to the business model of generative AI, i.e. there isn't one right now. Second, the problem of quality, the hallucinations problem. Uh, third, the issue of cultural resistance as people become more and more upset about AI and dislike it. And following on that third one, a fourth, which is uh, governmental regulations against AI. So I wanted to put those all on the table. But there are three more threats that I wanted to add. Uh, as Again, as we think about generative AI in all levels, should I use this in my own work? Should my institution use it? What should public policy be uh, about it? And so on. We have to keep in mind that the entire technology, all of this apparatus, from open AI to open source tools and hardware, could either shrink drastically, go away, or mutate massively in a very short period of time. So today I'd like to add three more existential threats. I'm going to build up to what I think is the biggest one of all. Now the first one to think about uh, is the limitation we have in terms of training data. That is, all of these major uh, open, um, all, sorry, all these major LLMs draw on huge swaths of the web in order to train their image tools and their text tools. And we know this from a lot of evidence so far. Not everything is completely open, but we do know that the sheer amount of data spidering, crawling, and crunching is, is vast. And there are a lot of reports that we are coming to a point where we won't be able to add any more training data. There have been some interesting proposals along these lines. There have been stories about some of the companies you know, thinking about buying a publisher so they get access to nicely structured um, data. There's been an offer by my friend Dan Cohen who suggests that generative AI companies should take a look at library contents and archives, again, for structured data. But we're really beginning to run out of material. Now, we can respond by shifting from emphasizing hoovering up so much data to improving our quality of software, uh, trying to get better and better results from smaller and smaller data. But this really does seem like we're approaching a hard limit in terms of what LLMs need in order to function, unless we can innovate our way beyond that. The second problem, and this is one I, I don't think is quite as serious, but is definitely one that's, that's talked about a great deal, is that the power needs in order to power generative AI are immense. And we can see this in terms primarily of data centers, as well as uh, the sheer amount of computation involved. And it's possible that we're going to run into a bottleneck in terms of sheer electrical power, as well as the ability to produce enough data centers to hold all of this. Now, I'll share in the show notes at, at least one article about this topic. I'm not quite as worried about this. Uh, I think that we have the ability to A, generate a bit more power, and B, to innovate our way so that we need less and less power in order to create more and more of LLM quality and output. Um, but this may be a short-term bottleneck, especially if politics becomes an issue, uh, such as wars. We already saw Russia's war in Ukraine uh, put a serious, did a real number on uh, on everything from renewables to uh, gas and oil, petroleum. Um, but also, we're seeing some problems in trying to roll out nuclear power. Um, but I want to put this out there because this is a topic that's talked about. Now, the third one. The third threat to generative AI that I want to mention today is, I think, in many ways, one of the largest. And it's one that we need to figure out a way beyond because this could really, in a snap, really crimp uh, what we're doing with generative AI. And that's the copyright problem. So really, really quickly, one note, the way copyright works as invented in Britain, then taken up by the United States and spread around the world to various degrees of effectiveness, is that when somebody creates something and puts it in a tangible form, you know, a printed book, uh, you know, a DVD, that kind of thing, you know, a web page with the date on it, and they can say, I have created this, I now own this, and I can decide how people consume it. 
Now you can, the creator can of course give away that copyright to somebody else, such as uh, an estate's heirs, uh, lawyers, or publishers, and so on. But any of those intellectual property owners share this common thing that they can decide how somebody uses that intellectual property. Uh, you know, you could publish a book and say people can only buy it on Thursdays. You can publish a song and say it'll cost you one million dollars to listen to. I mean, you have that exclusive right, and that exclusive right lasts for a very, very long time. Without delving into it right now, we're seeing the materials exiting copyright uh, tend to be dated back to the 1930s. So, why does this matter for generative AI? Because these big tools have been spidering huge amounts of the web without asking permission. They have been copying and, and, and repeating all kinds of web pages and videos and images and then hoovering them up and using them to produce generative AI. Um, quite a few intellectual property owners are unhappy with this. Uh, they feel that this is what lawyers would refer to as rampant copyright infringement. Now one defense, and this is a, a particularly American defense, is to say that the, you know, the companies involved are doing this in the spirit of fair use. Uh, fair use is a tricky bit of law, it comes from 1976, and uh, the great Larry Lessig once said, fair use really amounts to the right to hire a lawyer. But basically, you can, fair use gives you the right to claim unauthorized access if it meets certain tests. Um, and one of those tests is the use's nonprofit. Um, now, since all these companies, except for OpenAI, are openly for profit, thinking about, of course, Meta, Microsoft, Google, and OpenAI is a weird kind of semi-profit making thing, clearly in need of a lot of money, uh, it would be hard to make that case in court and have it stand up. And here I should, of course, explain, I am not a lawyer. I am not trained in law. I'm fascinated by it. I love the history of law. I've consulted with numerous law schools, but I am not a professional lawyer. So please add a giant grain of salt to what I'm saying. But it would be easy for any judge to rule that a tool like, say, Gemini or Copilot or Dal E is committing rampant copyright violation in its operation, and it should stop. So a judge has all kinds of abilities here. A judge could rule that the AI software must cease operations immediately under an injunction. The judge could order that some of the uh, materials be deleted, uh, such as its weights um, or its initial data set. Uh, there are a whole bunch of lawsuits right now underway from all kinds of intellectual property owners ranging from individuals to uh, big organizations like the New York Times. Um, one thing we have to anticipate is a possibility that a judge could take a look at a for-profit enterprise that manages to grab all kinds of content without paying for it, without asking permission, and turning it into profit. We should keep an eye out for such judges making such rulings. And we have to figure out, if we want to preserve large language models and generative AI, how to get past the copyright obstacle. So for today, those are the three biggest threats to AI I want to share with you. I think copyright's the biggest one uh, because the copyright violations have all happened already, again, at massive scale. Uh, I think the power one, um, if we flub things, might become a problem. And uh, also the uh, running out of training data set, I think, could be a problem if we don't innovate our way forward to use less and less data to produce better and better results. All right, I have an incredibly busy week ahead. Um, teaching a class at Georgetown, which is an intensive one, basically takes up the entire week for the next five days. I'm gonna try and follow up. Uh, some of you have very kindly offered comments or video responses to my previous video, and I promise I will reply to those. I will get back to those. Uh, in the meantime, I hope everybody is doing well. See Alien Romulus if you're in the mood for that. Otherwise, uh, I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you for your time.